Hello there everyone. There is but one faction left to talk about in our preparations for Battlefleet Gothic Armada 2 and that is going to be the Necrons. And as I hinted, as I teased enough throughout this entire series as well as some of my other videos regarding Battlefleet Gothic 2, there is a lot to look forward to or a lot to dread with the Necrons for in the tabletop version they were simply put overpowered, deliberately so. And now it's time to show you why that is. For the Necrons are simply put the oldest race that we, at least the, us as the players, have access to. They're even older than the Eldar, they're even older than the Orcs there. The only ones that come close to their age, how long they've si existed, is basically the old ones, which are the gods that pretty much create the Eldar and Orcs, for lack of better terms. So, their technology, their power, is simply put unmatched by everything else. But even with all their advanced technology, they were still plagued by either a, a disease that they could not cure or radiation poisoning that permitted the Necron, the Necron Tears they were originally called, very short lifespans. This ultimately meant that their jealousy towards the Old Ones as a result of all that led them to make a pact, a deal with the Satan, I believe they are called. They're these four, five star gods, I believe, that basically transferred the Necrontier into the robotic abominations that they are now and the ones that we are going to be encountering for Battlefleet Gothic Armada 2. And like what you would expect normally with high power to high tech units, they're going to be a lot more expensive from what we understand at least for Armada 2, but in the tabletop version they function completely differently there. Because you do scoring for points based on the amount of damage you did to ships as well as destroyed ships there, at the end of the match there once everything's disengaged after a certain amount of turns, you basically calculate the kind of score you had there. Instead of just uh, inflating the points of Necrons, instead what they did is punish Necron players for basically taking that damage or losing any ships there because it gave their opponents basically double the point value from what they would get otherwise. Which ultimately means the Necrons were just superior in every single way, almost exactly. Hell, their point values isn't even inflated that much more, even though they are more expensive than all the other uh, faction ships there. They are still not drastically more expensive, like a battle barge I believe in a tabletop game is like 400 points and when I talk about the tomb ship later on in this episode, it's going to be only 500 points, which isn't really all that drastic when you see what exactly the tomb ship is capable of. First up, let's have a look at the durability and the armor of the Necron fleet there in the reactive hulls. Lore-wise, it's meant to be really difficult to target and do actual direct damage to a Necron ship, but for the purposes of the tabletop game, they just basically gave them the armor of the Space Marines there. They have 6 plus armor all around, 75 armor in Armada sense, and they even have additional like a roll that they can do to kind of ignore any kind of damage dealt to them there. Even if it's like a Lance, even if it's like a Novakin, you still get to keep the second roll as a possibility to negate those shots there. And that actually will scale up. The bigger the capital ship, the bigger the ship in general. For even the frigates are going to have 75 armor all around as well as this additional save. Although it's going to be a lot weaker for the frigates to say like the battleship, mind you. And technically, this could play out in multiple different ways there. Like I said, lore-wise, the Necron ships are supposed to be harder to target, and that's the reason why the armor save is as you see here. But it's entirely possible if Tindalos feels it's warranted to kind of change that around to just basically make it more far more potent type of hollow field where it just actively reduces the accuracy of targets shooting at them. That would make sense. Whether it would fit the lo the theme of Necrons remains to be seen, but. Another thing to note is that if you ever do a Brace for Impact order in the tabletop version, normally that would give you like this additional save for like all other factions, but it would only be a 4 plus type of save there and it, it spends your order that you won't be able to use on your follow up turns. You wouldn't be able to lock on or all hit full is basically what I'm saying because you do the Brace for Impact as you're getting shot at it, not preemptively. But in the case of Necrons here instead, they swap the roles of how their armor functions basically. So you are sacrificing your base armor value there in exchange for near impenetrable save against what would normally go penetrate your armor, I suppose. So Novakans, Lances, if you feel like you're going to be overwhelmed by those type of weaponry there, you can use your Brace for Impact to instead have like, I guess if I want to translate this exactly in Armada 1 term sense, you would have a 75% chance to negate Novakans, you would have a 75% chance to negate Lances, and 
experimental railguns, torpedoes, bombers, all those would be heavily negated. And while this would make you weaker against macro cans in general, mind you, you still would get to keep that additional save even for them. So ultimately you are not getting weaker by using your brace for impact outside of it would hinder your fire potential power with, like I said you wouldn't be able to lock on and you actually wouldn't be able to use your other abilities that you have access to. But in our model 1 term sense there, considering the brace for impact instead actually increases your armor even further up to a potential 95% a complete 100% if resistance if you're space marines with a chapter master mind you. It remains to be seen how this is going to change for Armada 2, because that would actually make it inferior, ultimately I want to argue, for at least dealing with macro cans. It's going to make you weaker against that, even though it's going to be a tremendous boon to your survivability against like Novacan spams and torpedoes and bombers like I already mentioned. Now let's have a talk about the Necrons mobility. While in general their baseline stats are slightly faster, the most ships of the same class there, the tomb ship will be going 150 units there, 45 degree turn radius, but what makes them unique is that they don't have high energy turns, they don't have like come to new hang, which would be the equivalent of the tabletop version 2, your high energy turn, for it allows you to turn twice in a single turn. But in the case of this, their all ahead full special order has been improved to allow for a massive speed increase that also allows you to turn after you re reach a certain amount of distance there. And just so you, I can inform you on how the traditional all head full special order works, you roll four d6 dice and then you add it to what your current speed is of the ship you're selected, so, or moving with rather. So a retribution, a standard Imperial Navy cruiser with a, what is it, 20 centimeter speed, 150 unit speed, if it were to roll 4d6, you would add on top of that there. So a tomb ship, which argue, which will go to same speed, not arguable there actually. So it's going to go to same speed. You roll a single dice and you go 10 additional centimeters for whatever the result is. And to make it all worse there, they turn every single 20 centimeters as I already mentioned. So these things have both their speed boost and their maneuverability in the same ability. Although, was it Tindalos hinted at something like a micro warp jump possibility for their inertialist drive? So it could function completely differently there, which arguably a micro warp jump would actually fit, considering it allows you to reposition, it allows you to move forward rapidly. It just remains to be seen the cooldown on that, because inertialist drive, you could do it every single turn, there was no limitation to it, so. I imagine Necron are going to have very short cooldowns, which kind of would be amazing to see, especially when you consider that all the other factions are kind of losing their ability to have everything equipped with Micro Warp Jump. Now let's have a look at all these fearsome weapons that the Necron have available to them there, and a lot of them are going to be terrifying too. I also forgot to mention when talking about the armors that they're also in superior at the repair ability, which was also explained a little bit by Tindlos that they were going to have a faster, what is it, less cooldown for the recharge or repair timer, so that comes to be expected there considering what we I already mentioned. It showed in the wording there for the Necron armor as well, I just forgot to mention it, but Necron weaponry, let's talk about the big gun here. This is only going to be on their battleship, so this is the Sepulcher. I'm hoping, I'm really hoping I pronounced that right there, but basically not only does it immediately make them unable to insubordinate here as made apparent by the fact they're gaining maximum leadership, but it's a massive beam that basically will function exactly like the Chief Librarian does for the Space Marine favor, where you get to do the Fear of Darkness and cause a, a mutiny and insubordination on the enemy ship you're targeting. This will function technically the same way, at least if the wording is to be believed at least. And not only does it do that there though, it also has the means to destroy any type of bomber, any type of fighter, and any kind of boarding torpedo that's within its radius. It's like 20 centimeters, so at least currently that would translate to about 4,000 range there, so a little bit over the minimum range of most uh, close range weaponry, but still. This has a lot more versatility and it remains to be seen what kind of cooldown it has there. Since you're almost without a doubt going to have one of these in your fleet, unless by chance Tindalos decides to give us multiple battleships, in which, which case you're going to be causing a lot of insubordinations and a lot of mutinies as a result, assuming that's how it's going to translate in Armada 2. And you thought that was scary there? Just their basic weaponry is also ridiculously powerful there. For the lightning arc, for all intensive purposes, is their standard macro weaponry there. It just completely ignores hollow fields and shadow fields, which is the, was it, the Drukhari type of hollow field. So Eldar right off the bat are being, giving the shaft there, and it treats 
all ships that's moving towards them there for the purposes of how many dice you get for shooting at them in the tabletop version because as a reminder for how I explained before during when I was talking about Eldar there there's like modifiers that increase and limit the amount of dice that you get there if you're flying towards them there you're basically not really getting punished there you get more dice than you would if they're flying sideways or flying away from you and if they're inside 3,000 you range you get actually a bonus there where everything outside 6,000 you range you would get a penalty outside of like additional modifiers like the hollow field I mentioned earlier and not only that, although it will be interesting to see how this is implemented, if it's implemented at all, is that the tabletop version you're allowed to split your fire there, which may seem kind of weird at first, but considering almost the entirety of the Necron fleet has turreted weaponry there, you can split your fire onto multiple targets at the same time, so this may not be fair practical in a general sense, unless there's something that's about to be destroyed there, then you want to try and avoid overkilling, so this would be the only practical affect the practical reason this would be useful in far, as far as Armada 2 but I'm not exactly sure how they're going to implement it there if it's going to be like a an option you're going to have when you select an enemy ship kind of like how you prioritize what components you want to try and critically hit as well as the target priority that we currently have in Armada 1. And the Gauss Particle Whip is basically for all intents and purposes their lance weaponry there. It is as you would expect there it ignores uh, armor it always hits and to make matters worse there they basically have the orcs uh, ability to negate hollow fields and shields although in the case of the tabletop version you do need like a six on a six side dice mind you to actually bypass the shields but in that case then it would already be a hit since lance is near four five or six this just it compounds that power potential that the lances have there and when uh, what is it, looking at the video there that Tindall's uh, showed of demonstrating the Necron fleet in action, I kind of mistaked the Gulf's Particle Whip for the Sepulcher there, where in fact, the Gulf's Particle Whip is supposed to be as it sounds, it's supposed to be a whip-like effect there. Kind of like how the Orcs Lances, Sap Cans are kind of function there, to the same kind of vague extent there, so... I'm hoping, considering it's like an early alpha preview of Armada 2, I'm hoping they improve on that a little bit more, because it didn't seem very... Similar to at least the monolith of Dawn of War 1 at least with with how its particle whip works And I hate to break your hearts there, but not only do they have the equipment I just mentioned there They also have a Nova can in the star pulse generator Mind you how this pulse generator functions is a little bit different than the Nova can as you know it currently For this thing actually centers around the ship itself there. It's about a 4,000 unit blast with how it currently translates so and it's an AOE effect that hits everything in that radius it ignores other Necron ships there it remains to be seen if enemy Necron ships and like a potential mirror match will get affected by this but you can do a lot of damage with this and it's also at least in the tabletop version had means to destroy bombers as well as torpedoes that were coming your way which in all honesty is something you could do in tabletop in general you can prioritize your main macro cans your main lances to kind of shoot at torpedoes and bombers if uh, another target was not presented to you although it was very impractical it was really difficult to do mind you but since that never made to Armada 1 it remains to be seen if this can also do the same but one of the interesting weaknesses to note of the Necron ships is they have no actual fighters they have no actual bombers so I would imagine this would be one of the main ways it can clear out a heavy array of torpedoes and bombers that are coming at it there so it's more than likely this might still make it into Armada 2 to destroy those pesky little flies since they don't have effective means to destroy them otherwise. And also, this is not really technically a weapon there, but is included as such for the stat sheets, the data sheets that are on the Necron ships there. We have the portals, and this is just a much more potent type of lightning strike for the number of portals you have on a ship there dictates how many additional hit and run attacks you do to the target there. And just to give you an easy comparison there, the, was it, the tomb ship has three additional portals on it. The, was it, the cruiser has two, so basically you're going to be getting equivalent a number of boarding actions as you would with a traditional type of boarding action from all the other factions. So you're not getting penalized at all almost with these portals available to you as a Necron fleet. The only downside of course is they don't make them any more stronger. You're still only going to get likely temporary results but it makes it a lot more safer to 
can't constantly be harassing opponents with these boarding options while not putting yourself at risk there by any like close range boarding attempts, especially if you're facing off against like Space Marines or Tyranids, mind you. And hell, I almost even forgot to mention, even one of their frigates has access to a portal there, and it has special notes related to it down here, that they aren't able to lightning strike normally. They can only do it once they reach a certain amount of health points there, so they basically can only board like light cruisers or heavily damaged ships for all intents and purposes. Now, let's have ourselves a look at the ships themselves there. There's only like five different types of Necron ships as far as the tabletop version is concerned, but... I'm going to do something a little bit different here. I'm going to do very quick comparisons in the point cost of like other faction ships there, mainly the Imperial Navy and like Space Marines and Eldar when appropriate. But we're going to have a look at the frigates firsthand. You're going to see just how fastly different in power they p they potentially are. Because for one, the Dirch class Raider here goes on whopping 50 centimeters. I could not tell you for the life of me how fast that is because we technically don't have a ship that goes that fast. The closest that we actually have in all honesty that at least is easily easy to compare would be like the Space Marine frigates, the Nova, the Hunter, and the Chaos frigates there that are go at that kind of speed. And they only go like 35 centimeters in comparison mind you. So this Dirch class, well for all intents and purposes what? The Nova, the Hunter, they go 282 units set what is it, unit speed a second I do believe. So this thing could very easily go up to like 400, maybe even 500 units speed a second. Just be baseline. Never mind how fast it will go once it gets its inertial this drive going. If it is actually a speed increase and not the micro warp jump as we're, what's been suggested so far. And even as firepower is equivalent to even most other type of like heavy frigates, mind you. This thing is slightly weaker than a sword. It gets three dice instead of the four of the sword, but it's still pretty damn potent. It, the only one drawback is it's all stuck on the prow. It's not like a turret weapon, as opposed to the majority of other frigates. And the Jackal class Raider, which is the heavier fr frigate version, is going to be more of the same there. More power, it has the portal as well that allows it to board at close range, so 10 centimeters. It's going to be pretty equivalent, I imagine, to a normal lightning strike, if I had to guess there, which normally is just based on your sensor range. Unless they do drastic reworks to how scouting and the lightning strikes in general are going to work there. So this is your heavy frigate and it has the same kind of power as pretty much all the other heavy frigates of note. It's once again stuck to the front there but with its amazing speed, amazing agility and the inertialist drive that's almost a non-factor there. Never mind the fact that this thing's going to have six, was it 75 armor all around on top of the additional save. And keep in mind when you're looking at the shield save there for the Necron's reactive armor it's actually going to be what you're supposed to roll there. So you need a 6 to save the ship there, not opposed to a 6 plus as with what we're currently seeing in the armor there. So it might be a little bit confusing, mind you, because technically the player, the one who has the Necron ships, is rolling as opposed to the opponent there. So keep that in mind. But now it's time to start really terrifying you as we get to the cruiser classes themselves there. First up, we're going to have the scouting light cruiser in the shroud. And the reason you should be scared is that... For comparison of the other light cruisers there, the Aurora is 140 points for the Eldar with the Solaris at 130. This thing is only like 150 points or 155 points rather and it's also got enhanced sensors on it. The special rolls down below basically words it exactly similar to how the Emperor and the Widowmaker function. So not only is this thing going to be detecting you at 10,000 range if this thing was already in Armada 1, it's got the 6 plus armor, and it's got firepower equivalent to a tyrant. Mind you, it does not have the torpedoes, but it has that firepower potential there. And not only that, it's also 270 degree arc, so it's going to be hitting you as hard as a tyrant, it's going to be moving faster, far faster than a tyrant. This thing is going to be going, what, 225 unit speed? If the comparison is accurate, the one main downside, of course, is it only can turn 45 degrees, where most light cruisers can very easily turn 90 degrees outside the orcs, possibly. So, this thing's going to be scary, and as an additional note, there's another special rule on top of that that makes it harder to detect. So, how is that going to function exactly in Armada 2 is, is anybody's guess, really. Because does it jam your sensors there, making it so it has to get even closer before you ultimately detect it? Is it going to have some kind of cloaking element to it that makes it kind of like similar to stealth alloy? That's anybody's guess. 
The only thing I will say though, in the favor of the Imperial Navy Tyrant, is that it can actually shoot at two targets at once with really full firepower and get more fire damage potential that way. But if it's that close, it's probably not going to survive the next turn, mind you, let's be fair, since it's in the middle of everything. Realistically, Imperial Navy ships, anything with broadside weaponry is going to be more shooting from one direction, and very rarely, if at all, is going to get the benefit from its full firepower. Now, the actual cruiser for the Necron fleet is going to be a bit of a weird one, because for all intents and purposes, this Scythe Harvest ship has, like, broadside weaponry to it, although... It doesn't have it in a way that, like I mentioned with the tires, where it has two separate sets of weapons for each side. Apparently it only has one profile for firing both at the left and right, so... This thing may not have the fearsome broadside weaponry that it could have, but it has four lances on it. Which is quite a far cry from what you've seen with like Overlords or even any other regular cruisers, which barely have any lances at all on them. Outside the Mechanicus, which are also going to be included in Mark Armada 2. But... This thing has four lances, has good amount of firepower, slightly weaker mind you than the Scythe, and of course more restricted, but it also has a Star Pulse Generator. Keep that in mind everyone. It's going to be doing damage all around, and it also has two additional Lightning Strike options available to it once it's able to bring your shields down, it's going to be harassing you endlessly. And for comparison's sake there, an Overlord, which would probably be pretty close to a comparison to this, especially if you were to get a Mechanicus one with Novacans, I suppose. Although technically the Mechanicus can't use battle cruisers as per the rules, but either way, the Overlord is 235 points. While the Eldar Eclipse, and keep this in mind this is the cruiser variant of the Eclipse, is 250 points, and the new Dark Eldar Torture Class Cruiser is 210 points, so this is not drastically more expensive than either of them as well. Mind you, it even has 8 health points to it there, whereas opposed to the Shroud, which you saw earlier, only has 4 hit points to it, this does not get hindered in any way by its durability. In fact, it's enhanced, it's enriched even further with the additional shield saves that we're seeing here. Fi the 5 plus as opposed to the 6 plus that we've been seeing on the frigates there earlier. Now brace yourselves everyone for a tomb ship here. It's a whopping 500 points, but keep in mind, a uh, Space Marine Battle Barge is 425 points. An Eldar Void Stalker is 380 points there, a little bit cheaper than that. And a Chaos Despoiler with its 8 fighter waves is a whopping 400 points as well there. So with that in mind, let's have a look at this overwhelming firepower it has. It has firepower 20 strength there on all turret batteries. So it can shoot in four, it can shoot in front of it, it can shoot on the side, it can potentially shoot and split off its fire at multiple targets if it so wishes. And to just straight up spell out how powerful this actually is, a retribution with one side of its wet macro batteries firing is only firepower strength of 12. This thing is firepower of 20. It, it's getting really damn close to just doubling its firepower in the lightning arcs alone. Never mind the fact that it has six lances, it also has a star pulse generator, and it's completely unhindered in its lightning strikes because it's going to get four boring actions on top of your ass if you ever get there, get so close to it. Never mind the fact that it has a Sepulchre as well. I'm still really hoping I pronounce that properly. Its point defense currently is also equivalent to that of most other battleships there. And its invulnerability save, its shield save is a 4 plus now as opposed to this 5 and 6 plus we've been seeing before. So this thing can is basically a moving fortress. It can block Novacans 50-50% roughly to give you an understanding of that. So it's going to be blocking Novacans, torpedoes, and bombers half the time. Even without a brace for impact. On top of his armor as well, you're still going to have to get through because it is still technically 25 armor outside of like anything that completely ignores armor. Like the experimental railguns, Eld Eldar torpedoes, as well as the Imperial and Nova cannons that we already know. So this is a terrifying beast there. It remains to be seen how they're going to be retweaking this points for fielding these things in Armada 2. Because personally, if I were to be honest... I kind of would have liked them to introduce something that helps with the scoring like behind the scenes there for determining a winner, but it would not function very well when it's like an all or nothing type of cruiser clash battle, mind you. It wouldn't be very practical that way since all ships have to be destroyed before the timer runs out, which of course is a very lengthy timer that kind of encourages a lot of kiting, at least in Armada 1 for the mobile fleet so that way they can get the repairs back underway and still have plenty of time to face off against their opponent there, so 
with a lot of the new changes they're making to make sure you can't repair health points. That might change that dyna dynamic a little bit, but still, that would not function very well in Armada 1 anyway, since it's either you win or you lose. There's no in-between, there's no, like, draws, as it were. So inflating the points on these Necron ships is probably the right choice. It's not the most exciting type of way to do it. It's just the easiest, it feels like to me personally here. But hey, it just means that... Whereas in the tabletop version, the Necron fleets were always going to be dominating against you there. If you could destroy a single ship, maybe you might get a victory out of that alone. But with their points being inflated, the other factions are actually going to have a chance fighting the Necrons. That's the hope, that's the intention anyway. It remains to be seen if that's what happens though. And normally the Sepulchre is an upgrade option for the tomb ships there, which is kind of why you weren't seeing it on the stat sheet there for the tomb ship itself is actually an upgrade option that you have to invest more points in so that would be one way for them to inflate the points even further because that might be made baseline there unless well with the way admiral ships work you could probably make it like a skill option available if it's you're just gonna have to make all the other upgrade options or skill slots just as appealing since Armada 2 is going to be incorporating only Admiral ships allowing to have skill slots, skill abilities of any kind. But ultimately, I am really hoping that Tindalos find a way to make Necron as true to their power potential as possible. Because while personally I don't care about playing as Necrons, one of the things I was really excited about is actually fighting against the, El the Necrons. I only had like one or two matches against them there in my time playing the tabletop version. It was a fun little stomp, but that was with like extremely outdated rules. I never played with their updated codex after, was it a record 15, 10 years of it gathering dust, I suppose, with the older version, the old, older rule book that they had for Necrons. So I don't know if my opinion or my enjoyment of them would be the same, because they would be a lot more trickier and elusive to deal with, I would imagine. Never mind the fact that just how much more powerful they are, because on the tabletop version, they're basically exactly as strong as Space Marines. They're just not meant for melee combat, not as effective as anyway, but they still had the armor, they still had the durability, and their weaponry was the exact same. And with Space Marines like capitalizing on their boring potentials there, that kind of emphasizes just how dangerous even the Necron troops can be. So thank you everyone for watching this there. We are not quite done yet though, for I did not go over the compendium as much as I like for the other factions there, so what I think I'm going to be doing for next time is going to briefly go over all the additional stuff, all the additional upgrades that was included in the 2010 compendium to kind of enhance weaker factions and to try and add additional dynamics to like the factions we already talked about there. There was no inclusions, no additional rules or in items four Necrons in that compendium I'm pretty certain but everything else almost got enhanced in some form so we're going to be talking about that next time and I hopefully you have reason to fear the Necrons now.